Okay, let's get the show on the road. People got lives to live. Okay, if you guys were yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, it's recording. Okay, so we're gonna talk about techniques that we can use to get our price that we want and make the deal work. And what we'll learn today are these four things. Seller concessions, seller carrybacks, temporary buy downs, and seller finance. And we're gonna, I'm gonna show you what they are, when you use them, why you use them, and how to use them. Okay, so starting with seller concessions, this is the one you guys can probably know like the back of your hand. I've got a whole slide or two maybe on this. But it's also called seller credits. We in the lending world call it interested party concessions because it also includes agents' um, uh, concessions that, that you might want to throw in. So what is it? It's any closing cost and prepaid item that's normally paid by the buyer, but now it's being paid by the interested party, typically the seller. When a what? A appraisal. A um, You could. In fact, yeah. When and why do you use it? Inspection issues, minor repairs. Um, that's typically when it's used. But you can also offer a seller concession if you have an appraisal that comes in well. But it's up to you. How do you use it? Oh, buyer combination. That's me. All appraisals and buyer combinations. So typically, the, when you guys when the agent kicks in, it's only because everything the seller's not budging, the buyer doesn't have another penny to spend, but they they're just a little bit short, and so that's when you say, "Fine, I'll give you that thousand dollars out of my commission. Let's just get the deal done." So that that would be another time to use the um, concessions. How do you do it? We need an addendum to the contract. What I found happens a lot of times is the buyer might mention to me that, oh, don't forget, I'm getting a, a $5,000 credit. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, then I wait for somebody to send me the credit. Nobody ever does. So escrow needs to send us an addendum to the contract. And that's the, the way we find out about it. That's the way that we make it happen in the loan process. And then lender rules do apply when there are concessions. So you need to make sure that you're aware before you if you're coming up on a fairly large concession. So this is typically these are the Fannie Mae rules. They'll allow you to do up to 3% of the sales price if, it, if they're putting 10% down, 6% if it's between 10 and 25%, 9% if it's over 25. Um, so here, let me close those doors so it's a little less noisy. Or 2% if it's an investment property. But this could be different in different situations, and um, all jumbo loans have their own set of rules. So, if you're doing a seller concession and it's going to amount to something like three percent or two percent, even let's just check to make sure. And how do you want to be notified? So if you're just checking to see what you're what you're allowed to do, a phone call is fine. What about when we get like when we get um. um Okay, so now that's all I have on concessions, but now I've got temporary buy downs. Now, I actually just learned about these myself recently, and when I first looked at it, I thought this sounds too complicated. I don't want to notice. <laughs> but then actually, when I looked at it more carefully, I realized that it's not that complicated and it's really quite interesting and can be quite good. So what it is technically, there's something called a two-one buy down. In that case, the seller pays for a temporary reduction in the rate for two years. The rate is two points lower in the first year and one point lower in the second year. 
and I'm going to show you an example in a second, which will solidify what that means. You can be, use these on any conventional loan. So if the conventional loan limit applies in LA, it's currently 980. It's soon to be over $100. Um, and then um, you can use it on FHA, VA, USDA products. As long as the lender approves it. So, you do have to make sure that this is going to be something that can be done. Most jumbo loans do not allow temporary buy downs. Um, but buy down, the buy down money, the way it works is the, the funds are kept in an escrow account to apply towards the reduction in payments over time. And then, uh, so the lender takes care of everything. But, but the example is really where you're going to understand how this works. So here you've got a purchase price of six twenty five and a loan amount of five hundred thousand. Six and a half is the rate, and here's the uh, monthly payment. In a two one buy down, your rate the first year is going to be only four and a half percent because you get that two percent reduction. In the second year, it's five and a half percent. In your third year, it goes back to the normal six. Here's your normal payment. Here's your adjusted payment based on the new rate. And this is the difference in that payment. The seller is going to pay the difference, the subsidy times 12. So he's going to pay this amount. And he's going to end up paying in total $11,376,000 in seller concessions. I should say allow, not pay. So he'll take that as a reduction. It'll happen right away as far as the seller is concerned, and then the lender takes care of the semantics around how to apply all this. Now, you, your buyer might look at it and say, sounds nice, but it's complicated. Why don't you just give me the reduction in the price? Well, if you take that same 11376 and simply reduce the price, then your loan amount comes to 490 and change, same rate, obviously. Your monthly payment is now 3103 instead of 3160. You're saving a whopping $57 a month. And your break even before you're going to be able to hit this 11,300, you'll have to have, be in the loan for 200 months, which is about 16 years before you actually um, deplete all of that savings. And the chances that they're going to stay in that loan for 16 years before they refinance out or sell the property or whatever are pretty slim. So what does it benefit? Because the uh, payments won't change. So the payment to the buyer in the first year is only 2533. Second year it goes up to 2839, and then it becomes the normal payment. So to the buyer, that's pretty huge. Mm -hmm. And that might tip you over if you were, um, let's say that it's a 650 purchase price. Or, or actually, we should say it's a 625 purchase price. So the buyer might be coming in and saying, I, I only want to pay 600. That's my offer. But the seller really wants 625. And he's got nobody else offering him anything, and he really wants his 625, then he'll, he can say, what if I give you this 2 one buy down? You can pay me $625, i will give you the 2 one buy down. And then the, the buyer saves a bunch of money. He barely takes any training at all and his return. The property is sold. That's the whole point of this. Get it home and give them the incentive to buy. So when they agree to do that, they have to tell the lender, you will do all the paperwork for Yes. So you have to, before you even start negotiating this with the buyer, Make sure we go to the lender and say, can you do this? Is it allowed? And could that change the buyer line? Yes, it's for conventional FHA and VA, right? So most of the time they give up. Most of the time, yes. Yeah. Okay. When do we use temporary buy downs? We can use it when the seller needs to provide extra incentive to make the property. You can use it when the seller's only offer is a low offer. So, how many times have you been saying you had an open house, you get no offers, or you have one offer, and it's a low offer, a crummy low offer? <laughs> you want to say, how about if we do this instead? Um, and, or you can do it when the buyer's on the fence. So let's say that they make that lower offer and you come back and you say, um, you come back and you say, I'll take six, 
25 instead of 650, and they haven't countered you again. So they're sitting on the fence. They're not interested, or they're not saying whether they're interested. You give them plenty of time, then you can come back and you can say, let's try this. Um, if you've got issues um, and want to avoid making repairs, so let's say the public says, well, you know, I don't know. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in this house. I'm just not sure I want to pay the money. Then say, look, I'll give you this temporary buy down. This will allow you to have that much more money in your pocket to make your repairs and do your work. And then afterwards, when the property is worth more because you fixed it up, you can refinance it. If the borrower has good income but is cash strapped, like the OC, you know, you know they, they have plenty of money, but they just really did not have a lot of cash to get in the door. Something like that would have been super helpful. Or um, it's the same with, with them, uh, when the buyer has investment or retirement funds, but they don't really want to take their down payment money out of those funds. That, um, they would love to have something that will help them come in with less down. Or when the buyer could use a transition period to get comfortable with the price, let's say that they were renting really cheap and now their uh, mortgage payment is going to be like a lot higher. That will help them a lot. Or they just changed jobs, or they just went um, variable pay, or they just had a baby, or you know, any a number of those kinds of things. Um, they could really use that help in the first couple of years to get over the hump. So benefits for the seller that he doesn't have to concede that the house is worth less than what he's asking. And you know how emotional they are about that sort of thing. And it's a good ne negotiating tool to minimize the price reduction. For the buyers, um, it gives them a soft landing. It helps them adjust to rising rates. It's helps them get into the shop, especially for first-time home buyers. Okay. Okay. And it frees yeah. up cash for investors to fix it. Yeah. Okay. Well, those are some super helpful times when this uh, strategy is useful. I'm oh, sorry, did you want to? And by the way, um, I have a sign up sheet. I'm going to pass around. If you put your email address, I'll send you these slides so you don't have to really worry about the pictures. Oh, and I'm also going to um, pass around this article I just happened upon today. Five telltale signs that you have an overpriced list. Because these are all good tactics to use when you do. <laughs> okay. How do you do this? Um, it's typically paid through interest of party contributions by the seller or the agent. The lender, when it's true, applies, you just have to make sure that you're cool, the lender's cool with what you want to do. And then the lender sets up the custodial accounts and takes care of all the symptoms. Now we're going to get into seller carry backs. What is it, first of all? It's um, the seller holds the note for secondary financing behind the bank. And an example would be that the bank finances 80% of the loan. Seller finances 10%, borrower brings in 10%. In a seller carryback situation, it's always recommended that the borrow, borrower brings some skin into the game, otherwise it's a little too scary. And um, you know, obviously financing on the bank, you want to be as for, for it to be as beneficial as possible for the uh, price. Why would you do this? It allows the seller to get their desired price. Buyers get help from the seller to make the deal work. I don't know exactly. Coming right up. Okay. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> um, when would you use it? <laughs> so if you um, you could use it when the house is not moving, when you have a qualified buyer um, who just can't get sufficient um, financing from the bank. There can be any number of very legit reasons, like, um, for example, maybe they have a huge amount of stock options. Banks don't use stock options when they count their income. So the guy still has plenty of resources, but and he's still a very qualified client. But property, yeah, property resource. Yeah, there, there could be any number of reasons why they're still a great client, but the bank won't do the financing that they want. They won't do quite as much financing as they need. 
Um, you could offset a low appraisal uh, or other issues that could have potentially killed the deal. Uh, if the seller really wants to get rid of the property, really doesn't want to start over, this is one way that they might be able to say, okay, I'm willing to do this. Right? Is there paperwork for this? And that's also one of their reasons. I'm going to very bank view that kind of there's going to be like a, it's a second position then, right? Yes, it's yeah. a second position. So you have to uh, talk to the lender at that point and make sure is this something that we can do on up and up? Oh, and be open about it, or do, does this need to be a silent section? Yeah. So just, it, it could be done as a silent too, though. Yes. Yeah. So another reason that you would use it is if you've got deferred maintenance that are needed. Um, and so and there would be a house that has a lot of issues. It's probably a uh, good one for the, uh, the owner to carry some of the maintenance. And when the buyer has a short-term need with a specific exit strategy. And let's talk about what that could be. They have departing residents. They are going to be selling. As soon as they sell that house, they have money in their pockets. They are anticipating some income through either a bonus, inheritance, whatever. They got a fat check that they're expecting within the next few months. And so why not um, help them get along until they can? They're doing a remodel and a refi right away. They're fixing and flipping. So these are some really solid exit strategies. You've got a really qualified borrower, and you've got a seller that can um, manage to, to pocket to, to delay gratification for some portion of the funds that they've been getting, then uh, they could carry some of that financing. Okay, here's what you need to answer your question. You need two things. You need a promissory note and a deed or mortgage. The promissory note is going to spell out all the specific terms of the loan. And you can use your standard RPA to put all those terms in there, or you can hire an attorney to put this document together. As far as the deed or the mortgage, that spells out what the seller's rights and powers are, what happens in case of a default. And you can ask your escrow closing agent or an attorney to prepare this document. And in the silent second, you, what you do is you hold on to the deed and you don't record it until after the mortgage is recorded because anything that happens prior um, would be potentially problematic. So, who does that go to? If it's actually silent, it's just uh, the person handling the loan, but they can. You know, if you once you bring it up, isn't it not silent anymore? So um if you talk to me about this happening, I would tell you, can we do we have room to do it as a you know a legit second? And if not, then I'm just gonna say we can't do it. And yeah. you're gonna handle it all outside of the moment. Mm -hmm. We can fit silent. Why is it called a sell back? It's called a seller carry back. Oh, carrying back some of the uh, I get it now. Yeah. So some optional terms that you can throw in there, and this is all the, the, the terms of your mortgage here for this loan can be anything you need or want or desire. And this can be on both the buyer and the seller side. So that means you can have the payment down payment deferred. You can tier the interest so that, for example, it's, it, it would be one rate, it'd be 4% if they paid it in the first two years, 5% if they took three years, and 6% if they took four years, something like that. You can, they can be um, only making interest only payments and then a balloon payment at the end. There could be no payment due at all, but at the end, if they fix and flip the property, they, you, you know, uh, prior seller gets shared profit, and they can make the payback contingent on after repair value. This is basically, you know, a design your own type of finance so, because there's no mortgage or bank involved. And how does this look on title? The buyer is the owner. The buyer is the only one on title as an owner. The bank is in the first position, mortgage order. And the seller is in the second position and they're a junior mortgagor. So they would be the second ones to get paid in the case of default. 
and then ways to manage the risk because there is risk with this, right? They're taking out a loan and it may or may not get repaid. There could be some problems there. But the cool thing is, if you're in junior position and there's a bank in first position, you bet your bottom dollar that bank is going to be acting to foreclose on the property if the client is default on payments. So they're going to do the heavy lifting if it does go into foreclosure. And if they if they're paying the bank, but they're not paying you, and you start a foreclosure process, and the bank gets rid of it, then the bank's going to call the note, and then the client's going to be in a world of trouble. So there, if there's no benefit to them to pay the bank, but not you. Uh, two questions: What's the most amount um, that the person, other than the loan people, can give? Like, is it ten percent, or could it be more than ten percent interest rate? Can you one hundred percent? Oh, the like, say my mom wants to be the one that helps yeah. me, but I have to give her payments for yeah. the next amount, and yeah. I do the promissory note with her, and yes, all that. What's the most I can pay from her? You There's know? no you can do the whole. You can do a hundred percent. You could be the bank. And do we get it notarized? Is that how to legalize? Yeah. It? And that's called seller financing. Okay. Bank, there's no bank involved, and that's what's coming up right now. Okay, okay, I'm ahead of the game. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Right. The right questions. Yeah. But they are the right questions. Okay, more risk management. Make sure that your buyer has skin in the game and they've been vetted by the way. So um, I think it's important to understand who you're working with, that you're not just doing it because you're doing it. And um, just assuming that somebody's going to be, you know, good about paying you because you can't just, it's too risky. Um, the seller can request income and asset docs and credit reports, and the lender can get it. Um, and that's if it's at the second assignment. So uh, it does no good for the seller to get their income and asset docs and credit report if they don't have it. And they, they don't have it. When I wouldn't expect them to, a lender would, you know. And then make sure there's a solid exit strategy. If you have these things in place and you're taking a small position, um, I, you know, you're in good shape. Let's talk about seller financing. This is 100%. They do the entire financing. They hold the note, they'll take the sole lender position. I'm really kind of excited about this one because in the right circumstances, this could be really a great thing for both seller and buyer. So first of all, what are the right circumstances? And it could be that it especially is good for homes that are free and clear or the balance that's owed on them is minimal. And it might, might be the size of a down payment. So um, there, there might be $60,000 or something like that. And you'll see why as we talk through this. But free and clear is kind of the magic word. Um, the, if the mortgage is hard to get because maybe it's a manufactured home, land, distressed property, the kind of thing that um, it's really going to be hard. Someone shows you that big, ugly house and you're thinking no bank in the world is going to find it. This is not what I do. So that's when you want to explore whether seller financing might do the trick. If it's an inherited property, because if, um, if you've got a property that uh, the kids, for example, have their own homes, they live out of state, they don't need this home, they don't need the money from this home right away, they might be willing to take on the financing and instead get the monthly check rather than, um, you know, let it go to the bank and, and have to pay huge taxes. Uh, th this is a good way to sell property that's as is, that maybe has health and safety issues, Major repairs are needed, roof, plumbing, et cetera, all the things that lenders don't lend on. Or it's a divested rental property with no 1031 exchange. And what I mean by that is you've got a client who is um, a seller, was an investor, had a bunch of investment properties, and is slowly selling them off because they don't want to, they want to simplify their lives now, they're in, in retirement, they don't want their family to have to deal with the rental properties. And so they're not going to be doing, this wasn't an investment property, they're not going to be doing a 1031 exchange. So this is, this is probably, this and the free and clear are the two that are the biggest hot buttons that to look for a seller financing opportunity. 
So benefits to the buyer. The seller gets his price, but the buyer gets his terms. There's no need to qualify with the bank. There's less money down. There's no PMI to worry about. Uh, there's less mortgage expense and room potentially to negotiate for a purchase price. It's not just for investors, and there's no credit reporting involved. So a lot of upside for the buyer. For the seller, he gets his price in terms that are attractive to the buyer. He can potentially defer capital gains. So if you're if you got that free and clear home that you're selling and it's for a million dollars and your uh, couple. 500,000 of it, you can roll into your next house, but the other 500, you get socked with the taxes. So um, if you don't want to pay those taxes and you want to pan down the road, keep the pick the can a little bit longer, this would be a great way for them to do that. Mm -hmm. um, there's passes, passive income that they get by having this lien, so they get to earn a nice rate of return at the going rate um, and uh, it, it's just like an investment at this point. The promissory note, sorry. I was going to say they don't pay income tax on that, but still, you like capital gains, it shouldn't be income tax, right? So it's, it's interest earned, so I think it's. Yeah, we're on the portion of interest they have. Yeah. Okay, the promise. Is the buffalo day some deductions, right? High deductions of the seller. Yeah. yeah. Um, the promissory note can be sold to a private investor. So let's just say I just I said, okay, yeah, I'll sell my house. I'll take the note for it, and um, you're paying. So now I'm deciding, you know what? I really need that cash, and you're not ready to pay me off on that yet. I can actually take that note on the secondary market, and if you're a good um, paying customer, I can get at least ninety percent, uh, ninety cents on the dollar, or you know if you're Delinquent, somebody will still buy that. They'll still buy it at 65 or whatever. Um, if this is an inherited property, you get to your defer your taxes and your capital gain, and, and you have a capital gain income stream. No, you gain an income stream. Sorry about that. Um, if it's investment properties, you get to defer the taxes. You continue to make money on the property. But you don't have any responsibilities, no tenants, no turnover, no repairs. So this is the big win for the guy who no longer wants to be uh, a landlord. And then there's no real estate agent fees. What you do is you make the buyer pay them. Yeah, one thing. What? Not only did they get their price, but they're also making the money on the interest. Well, 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 yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's which is a big plus for them. But yeah. you the cycle. Massive. Yeah. But that's the fascinating part of it. Yeah. So here's an example loan structure. And everything here is 100% negotiable. But in this example, we got a purchase price that's going to be your full price offer. We got a down payment of 10%, or, or it could be less. There's the home's not in pristine condition. And we got a rate. The seller finance should finance it at going rate. So right now it's roughly five, six percent. They shouldn't be doing 10 percent or you know, whatever. And there's such a thing called usury laws, and that would be 10 percent is what California usury rate is. And then you've got your payment. Normally it would be amortized over 30 years, and there would be a balloon payment in five years. So in this example. Um, they're giving, they're financing the entire note, but they expect you to be out of it in five years. Options, okay. So you can apply the same other terms here, the same little quirks if you want to. Sorry, for the profits of the notes, can you scroll behind it? Um, they would in a uh, carry back. Uh -huh. On this, I re would recommend you go to a screen. And I got that So um buyer will pay the agent fees and the attorney fees. So do it right. Uh, go to an attorney and just charge the buyer for that fee. Do that. You can still give a credit, uh, seller credits 
purses reduction of price for major repairs, taxes, or other liens. Credit, um, credit can be applied to payments, to earn costs to the buyer. There's, there's all kinds of, you know, there's no rules to this loan. You can make up your own rule as long as it makes sense. And you've got somebody who's looking after you, like lender, lawyer, you know, title agent, those, those kinds of people are looking out for your own good. You can design this thing. So here's an example of a buyer. So um, you can go in and you can say, let's take that 650 guy. Um, I want to sell my house. I want to get a price of 650. Well, I can go in and I can say as a buyer, potential buyer, okay, I will offer you 500,000 all cash, or I'll give you 600,000 with bank finance, or I'll go ahead and give you, I'll actually give you 650 if you take one. So if you've got the right kind of seller, I would definitely make multiple offers and try to get the best deal. Now your client may or may not have an opportunity to do this all cash, and you can go to a private lender and you can get it back that way, and you can like be comparable. But um, that, so that would be a way for them to either get the property cheaper, go to the proper the normal bank channel, or just get seller finance. One thing that's a little bit different is uh, how does subject to finance work? Is that just a selling alone? Yes. Without the, it's like a sign like the bank doesn't yes. even know it. Yeah. You're just assuming it, taking it over. And is that even legal? Or in some cases, maybe and maybe not in others? I think that the bank wouldn't allow it, that the one that you're taking over the loan for. Yeah. But they don't, if they don't know, and you're making their payments, and you're getting their payments, yeah. they're not going to ask you questions. I know a lot of loans, they have the alienation clause where that automatically it's, it's all due. Right. They find out, mm -hmm. but the, the, some of the older mortgages didn't have that. Yeah. So does it depend on the mortgage? Is it something you got to find I, out? Or I think in those cases, they just count on the fact that the bank is there as long as it's not. Right. Yeah. But they have to have a point of view because the bank finds out the call. Yeah. So I know that, that one guy that I follow, Case Morby, he's doing all his deals are subject to. I know some mortgages have that alienation clause. Yeah. So. Okay, where am I? Okay, so here's an example. And I think, again, numbers really tell a good story. So here's your $700,000 purchase price across the board. But here's three different scenarios 20% down, owner occupied, 30% down, non owner occupied, 10% down, owner occupied, or 10% down, seller financing. So you've got your down payments here that vary pretty dramatically. Agents fees, which are going to be paid by the seller in, in the case of seller clients. And your loan amount is going to be pretty vastly different. Your mortgage rates will be similar. There's points involved with this guy, but not the others. Just trying to see what price it is today. Here's your P and I payments. So here you've got your um, monthly costs, your P and I, P I T I A, basically your taxes and insurance, and your prop and your uh, P and I payment. So here's the difference between your payments and these various options. Here's the difference between your cash and close. You can see you can see it's a huge savings in cash and close if you go with this ten percent down seller financing or the ten percent down bank financing. But the seller finance and your monthly payment is considerably less. So what the seller gets on this deal is they get annual income of forty-two thousand nine hundred forty-five, which is this forty-five and the thirty-five seventy-seven times twelve is forty-two thousand forty-two thousand dollars. If the client keeps it, the buyer keeps it alone for five years, they will have picked up two hundred and fourteen thousand and change. Plus, they got their down payment of seventy thousand. 
plus at the end of five years, they get a balloon payment, which according to the amortization table would be 583 and change. And they walked away with that with um, 868,000 in their pocket for a home that would have sold for 700,000 if they would have just sold it and let the bank take it out. So huge difference in savings and benefit for the seller, considerable savings for the buyer, especially if this is meant to be an investment property, because look at the amount of cash on pocket they would have to make for that. What the payments a lot lower on this investment property, but it's because they put a much bigger down payment. You know? So numbers say it all on this deal. So who would be responsible for keeping track of the payments and the interest accrued? Loan servicer. So who would be who would be a third party? Yes, and here we go. Here's how you manage your risk. Get a loan app and credit report. Realtor can write up the sales contract. Have the attorney write up the promissory note. And have the loan servicer collect your payments into your tax report. And the, the buyer can pay for these fees, not you. They can pay for your loan servicer. They can pay for the loan servicer. There's people who do that. I can put well. And they can pay for you. So the buyer pays for all of this stuff, which is all needed to manage your risk. And it fits to you. Buyer pays the listing commission, and there's no buying agent. You get a strategic partner because you start working with a real estate attorney and potentially loan servicer, lender, whatever. Um, you get everyone you work with is your new strategic partner. You gain an investor client, and we all know that investor clients are frequent flyers. They tell their friends and so on and so on and so on. You can potentially help the seller find a private uh, money lender to sell their note if they are interested. And all of these things, by the way, your resource for anything or anyone you don't know on here is me. Just kind of like <laughs> so anything you need to know how to do or need help doing, I'm here for it. So the lender benefit, which is me, I'd gain an investor client if I did this with you, if I helped you with this. I would gain a private lender. I would give the client loan options. So you got a client who wants to do seller services, you got a perfect seller services scenario. What you do is we talk. I tell you, have the client do the loan app with me. I'll tell them, do you even have loan options? Here they are. Here's your bank finance loan options. Or here's how you would uh, you could draw it off with the seller direct. I'd get referrals. I get the refi down the road. It's a win win for everybody. So let's get creative. If you're having any issues moving property, you got buyer constraints, property issues, et cetera, then we need to put our heads together and figure out how to get the property to move. The seller gets the highest price, the buyer can get creative about the terms. Let's put our heads together and see if these or other options might make the deal move forward. So bring me any questions, any deals, any time. Always and any other um, um, training requests that you can ask because well. this was requested by two agents, so I'm happy to always bring you whatever you need. That's one of my biggest questions. Uh, thank you. You're, you're welcome. It's the biggest piece of the puzzle. Exactly. Yes, we probably find ways to ever go through. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's fine. 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 It
But what can we do to get Interesting to me. Yeah. No, no, no. She paid it off. Do they need to be paid off? No, no. 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 Subject to a similar without the bank. She makes the money on the interest, wherever you agree on, she's probably going to charge you less interest than, than she would anyone else. Good. Oh, yeah, I mean, you can do whatever whatever she wants. She can do zero percent if she wants. You know, it's up to, it's up to you guys. Obviously, you don't want to take advantage, but you know, I'm sure she's going to give you a better deal. Than she I want to buy a house at some point. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. 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 Huh? Yeah. I mean, I'm assuming that I have to say, yeah. 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 my brother was shitting at it, wanted to buy my phone's house. Oh, yeah. There's no, there's, as long as it's, it, it doesn't even have to be family, but obviously family is a big benefit. Right. Yeah. But it could be two total strangers making a green that, and then the seller is going to be the bed. Yeah. But obviously, it would be risky to not do a background check right. on right. the person's income and the yeah. But the family, it's like you know the history anymore. But, um, but that's the part of it. So you can do that with the stranger. Yeah, that's about yeah. one thing about real estate yeah. is like there's a million ways to spend the cash. So, wow, yeah. great every day. Yeah, you're welcome. I have no idea. 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 I Pretty big Some say it's French, and some say it's like one of the kings of Israel. Some say it's Israeli, some say it's French. Well, it's a French name, too. I would choose to believe the king of Oh, thank you. I think my last name is more royal, though. My last name is Kennedy. I have a very royal last name. Super long. Nicholas, that's a lot of money. Do you want to read? Yeah, I'll sign it. Try it. If you please, I'll try it. Okay, just try it. 
Is it a DR at the end? Yes. People will never guess my uh, The most messed up. There we go. Half Kessler. Half the reason. Half the reason. You can give yourself a, a name. Like a I'm trying. Yeah. You can be like, I don't know how to do that. I think so. 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 You can do it. It's uh right now the MLS changes the where it has to be under your MLS thing, under your license thing. Okay. Before you just kind of like you can have it abbreviated because like my room is Astro, but I put it under Casey under the MLS. They recently changed the where it has to be under your MLS. That's to be a moment. That's your name that you got your license under. Yeah. Legal so, name. Yeah, but like under your cars and branding. Oh, so maybe you can change the branding. You might be able to do the same for all your marketing materials. Even your name tag, maybe, or your card. Yeah, this all your branding. You tell us about MLS. You have to use the original. Yeah, just when it comes down to the MLS, it looks just different. This is card Yeah, you can do your nickname, that, your business card. I mean, I like the that. Unless that could be a funny break in the eye that makes everyone laugh. Like, well, how how do you think my name is? And then, like, they make people laugh. For example, like, if someone has their business card, it's an ice man. Like, Jerry Jerry Ice. But it's very hard to. Yeah. Maybe Nick or just so my nickname uh, was Tavel. 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 It's
So what kind of work is being done? So uh, in all you uh, can you meet at the in house like after thirty something and then we can go to the other place. Sound good? Yeah, because I don't want to. I don't want to be here like we're here or doing nothing. If you can come over here right now, you go. But if you want to do anything later, it's fine. No, I'm the dog is I can watch I don't need to get Oh, I don't know. I have to check. I have to be at the location. Oh. Hi. 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 So I come, I come all the way to the town or all the way to the town. Okay, I'll do it. Okay, I'll do it. Okay, I'll do it. Okay, I'll do it. No, I, I have an order to check from the students from me. Oh my God. And so also, you... I have to. I want to go. My clients want to buy property to rent on the day for the Before the time of the month, some people do the rest of the one and five. Yeah. 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 Uh, we uh, should ask has to be only on the part or part of part of the 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 part of yeah. Oh, I think number one. So, do you want to find that Calvin? I'm going to call her to see if she's okay with condo. I like any of the It's a nice place. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Sajun. Um, hi, Sajun. Um, condo to Chalba, say to my dear, hi, enjoy the match. And is two minutes or two bathrooms? Two bathrooms for that, yeah. And who do you want to do? Is it family? Bad, um, 
یکی از بچه ها هم امروز گرفت بخش سه هزار و دویت Thank you. 